Are you a dark dreamer? Versatile composer, editor, and director, John Ottman most exhaustively is. Listed by Daily Variety in 1997 on their 50 people to watch list, Ottman's talents have apparently unleashed a new triple hyphenated threat upon the film industry. For in 2000, all three of these skills were put to use for his directorial debut, Urban Legends Final Cut. Previously, for Brian Singer's apt pupil, John Ottman did double duty as both composer and editor. On an earlier duel undertaking for the usual suspects, he won a British Academy Award for his editing and a Saturn Award for his music. Still best known as a composer, some of his credits include Goodbye Lover, The Cable Guy, and Halloween H2O. Recently, John invited us to his home in Los Angeles where we discuss the insane theory that having three heads must be better than one. John, could you tell us about your current feature called Iraq Attack? Uh, Iraq Attack is uh, a film I'm scoring, and it's uh, for Dean Devlin and Roland Emmerich, who are the two guys behind uh, Independence Day and Godzilla and the big, the big monster event films. And this one's uh, an art film, though, about giant spiders attacking the, the world. No, it's, I'm just kidding. It's, it's actually not an art film at all. And, uh, but it's, a, it's, a, it's fun to uh, have infiltrated their team and, and uh, do a score for them. And uh, it's, uh, it's sort of a tongue-in-cheek uh, monster film that their inspiration for was uh, the movie Tarantula, which was, I think, a 1950s uh, monster film. So it's, uh, it's sort of in that spirit where it's, uh, the score has to be suspenseful, but at the same time let the audience know that uh, this isn't supposed to be necessarily serious. So I have to sort of put a wink in the eye. Um, the whole time with the score, so the audience knows uh, we're just kidding. Well, what's the deadline like to compose a feature film? I mean, is um, it weeks, usually, months? Usually the deadline to do a score is, is, uh, is always brutal in some way. Even if you're hired early on, it ends up being brutal in the end because uh, in, there's usually all the efforts in the world to bring the composer on early, to start writing, but, but the film always is in flux and the re-editing and re-editing, having new test screenings and then re-editing the film again. So in the end of the day, um, you probably have maybe three or four weeks to write a score, which depending on the, on the minutes of music and the size of the score may not be bad, but a rack attack is about 90 minutes of music for you know a 90-piece orchestra, so it's, um, it's uh, going to be complete sleep deprivation process when uh, by the time you get to the scoring stage, you're usually um, near death. And um, and uh, you've got to keep yourself conscious somehow, just just to uh, to be there for the scoring. And if you record in town, it's not bad. But sometimes you go to Europe, and then you're flipped around nine hours, and you're already um, uh, devastatedly tired. You know, on Urban Legends, uh, we went to Munich and uh, made the idiotic decision to the day we got there record the next day. Is there any times when you've had a, a, a very strong idea how the score should run and then eventually the director totally changes that your conception of it? I haven't had that happen too badly because uh, from the very beginning I tell them the concept and then right away have them hear a rendering. Here's what I'm thinking. So it's like I don't want to write an hour of music and then say here's what I did. Um, which actually at the time of this interview right now is the, one of the few times I've done that. I actually just wrote 45 minutes of music for a rack attack and they're hearing it for the first time on Friday. So I'm terrified. So again, I may not have been the ultimate composer by the time this interview comes out. I hope I am. Uh, but normally I never do that. It's just, it's just hap gonna happen that way with this particular movie. Um, so no, but there have been um, a couple instances where despite the fact that the director has heard everything and we get to the stage all of a sudden, it's a composer's worst nightmare. You've got 90 people sitting out there, thousands of dollars an hour are flying through the window because the clock is you know, ticking, and you're in a panic to get the score done so you don't look like a person who's a, who's a, a money waster. And the director suddenly says, you know, what if we tried a different idea? And you're like, okay, what am I supposed to do now? And, and that can be a disaster. And that happened a couple of times on, um, on my, my first big movie, which was Cable Guy. And Ben Stiller is a great guy, but just was suddenly had this new idea, and uh, it was uh, it was it was a really great inauguration for me, or um, to get into the whole the big scoring world because I got to experience every uh, fear I had, and that was one of them.
Halloween H2O. Mm -hmm. John Carpenter is, is well known as director and of course well known as well as a composer. When you were doing the score for Halloween H2O, was there any bit of John's music in the back of your head? Oh, absolutely. I mean, the whole reason I wanted to do Halloween H2O was because being a, a soundtrack fan all my life and, and growing up watching Halloween and so forth with that, with that theme that's become this cultural iconic thing in the back of all of our minds, which puts, you know, what makes the hairs raise in the back of our neck, I thought, what a great thing to do that theme, but now in its, in, in its full glory with a, with a gigantic orchestra, because all of his stuff is very small and synthesized, which worked really well for the movie. But this was an event film, 20 years later, and it's bigger. And so I thought, how great would it be to do my style meets John Carpenter? And that was... Um, one of the funnest things I've written was the main title sequence. I, I adapted his theme, made it fully orchestral, and then wove in my own theme for Laurie Stroud, which was a new theme that I added to the film. And, um, and uh, it's one of the few cues in the film that's completely intact uh, because uh, the, uh, the, the final mix of that film became a bloodbath, and uh, a lot of the score got chopped up like hamburger and rearranged, and it happens sometimes. Um, which was heartbreaking, and uh, I don't know why I care so much on a film like H2O, but I do, and it was uh, it was wrenching. But uh, but it was it was great to at least have done that sort of uh, um, uh, overture in the, in the beginning with his theme. Now, an obvious idea would be that you would have scored X Men. Yes. And why not? <laughs> well, that was one of the most agonizingly painful things of my career. Um, I was supposed to score X Men. And um, there was not a problem, and the, the, uh, the misnomer is that I chose to direct a teen horror film instead of scoring the film of my life, which is not the case. Um, X-Men was teetering on, on disaster. It wasn't, it wasn't going to happen. It was red light, green light, red light, green light for months. And I finally told Brian, the director, I said, look, i I got to do something, you know. So um, I've been offered this film out of the blue to direct, Urban Legends 2. Um, I don't know if it's a mistake or not to do a teen horror film as my inauguration or my, 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 uh, for film directing, um, but I was talked into it. All my agents said, what are you crazy? You're being offered a $15 million movie, do it. So um, I signed to do it. And um, at that time, there was absolutely no conflict between our schedules. I, my film was gonna be done in the video stores by the time I was ready to score X-Men because X-Men had a very long shooting schedule and they were supposed to release in December of that year. Well. A couple months after I was involved in Urban Legends, uh, Fox accelerated their release schedule to July, and our schedules, schedules were suddenly in conflict. Um, so here I am doing my goofy little movie, which I'm, you know, glad I did, and and uh, and I think that for what it was, I I I did the best I could on it. Um, but um, to think that I was doing that and giving up. The score of my life, and, and the irony being that we were shooting within blocks of each other. I would go visit him on his X Men set, and he would come visit me on the Urban Legends set, and um, and I'd be looking at his gargantuan sets, just in awe, and and then the thought that I may not be able to score the film was just really depressing for both of us. And in the end, it was in like it was within a week or two. Uh, that's how close it came. I was on my final dub, and had I. Had I finished just a couple weeks earlier, I could have scored X-Men, and so it was hard to take. So I decided, for, for better or for worse, uh, to now uh, put off uh, directing. I had been sent a lot of scripts to direct after Urban Legends, which were more teen-related, teen and I didn't want to get trapped in the, in the, in the teen, uh, teen uh, zone. So uh, I decided to do X-Men 2 because uh, you rarely get second chances, and um, then I'll psychologically have closure. Okay, I did the X-Men thing, and then uh, it's open as to what I can do after that. John, you also composed the score for Urban Legends 2, Final Cut. How difficult was it working with the director for that film? It was more difficult than I had possibly imagined. Um, uh, you know, as, a, as, the, as the editor on the film as well, I uh, had temporarily scored it with, with soundtrack music to to sell my cuts to the studio and to have test screenings and so forth. And the director in the film uh, fell so in love with the temp score, he was terrified to uh, depart from it at all. And this is what happens with directors. So I suddenly was in that position. Um, so the composer in me uh, had a difficult time convincing the director in me to to step away from the temp score and do something new. John, you've had a very uh, varied career as a successful composer, editor, and now director. 
Is there some sort of master plan behind all these talents? Yeah, I do have a weird plan. Uh, because I sort of lost out on my big score, X-Men, which was going to give me, in one way, psychological closure to my scoring career, yet make put me on the A-list so I could get films easier as a composer if I wanted them. Because um, I lost that, I sort of have this psychotic desire to to do that to do that and x-men 2 is a sort of way to to have a second chance and um the cost in that holding out for x-men 2 has been say no to a lot of directing projects um but the the game plan is to score a lot of films and sort of build um a cushion financially so that i can get through x-men 2 and have the option and i think the doors are still open and go direct something that I feel more personal to that may not pay a whole lot of money, but then I won't have to worry about it because I will have been a scoring whore for a while. Join me here again on the wild side of the imagination where a sense of wonder and a feeling of terror can often intersect. You'll find us waiting here, the dark dreamers. <laughs>